This is the new 2020 Tesla Model Y, and it is the newest Tesla on the market. Deliveries began just a few days ago, and it's a big deal because this is finally a relatively affordable family crossover SUV from Tesla. And today, I'm going to review it. I've borrowed this Model Y from a viewer here in the San Diego area who got one of the very first ones built, and in fact, the very first one that was sold new to a customer. And in my mind, it's a really big deal, probably the most important Tesla on sale right now. That's because everybody wants SUVs and crossovers right now. That's where the market is heading, but Tesla's lineup is heavy on cars. The majority of their sales are the Model 3 and Model S sedans. Tesla does have a crossover, the Model X, but its starting price of around $85,000 places it well out of the reach of mostly everyone. But that changes now. The base level Model Y will start around $40,000 when it goes on sale sometime early next year. That's still not Honda CRV cheap, but it's far more affordable than the Model X. Right now, two versions are offered. You can get the long range model with a range of about 320 miles and a starting price of around $53,000. Or you can upgrade to the performance, which this is, is a starting price of around $61,000 and a zero to 60 time of three and a half seconds, which puts this deep into sports car territory. And yet, this is no sports car. Quite the opposite, actually. It's a family crossover, about the same length as a BMW X3 or a Jeep Grand Cherokee. And like those models, the Model Y seats five, with two rows of seats, although Tesla says a third row is coming sometime next year to expand the Model Y's practicality. This particular Model Y is well equipped with the performance upgrade and with Tesla's autopilot self-driving system for a sticker price of just under $70,000. And today, I'm going to review it. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of the Model Y, and I'm going to show you all of the interesting quirks and features of the latest Tesla. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Model Y in the most important area, and that would be pointing out the differences between the Model Y and the Model 3. These cars share about 75% of their parts, but there are some key differences that I'll show you, and that means starting in the back seat. Now, the Y is a larger car than the 3, intended for more family use, like a crossover would be. To that end, I'm happy to report that legroom is just fine. I'm 6'3", six 6'4", foot six foot for reference. The drive seat is positioned where I would sit in it, and I have good legroom and knee room back here. It's not huge or overly abundant, but more than enough for me to sit comfortably, which is nice. More important, though, is headroom. I was really concerned that headroom would be an issue in this car because of the sloping roof design. You can see it kind of slopes over the back seats, and I thought that would limit rear headroom, but that is not the case. I am sitting back here perfectly upright, and I still have a couple of inches between my head and the roof. Now, part of the reason for that is this panoramic glass roof, which is not as thick as a typical vehicle headliner, which gives you a couple of extra inches of room, just enough for my head to fit in here. But I can confidently say there is ample rear seat room back here, more than the Model 3 for both heads and legs, in the Model Y. Now, I will say there is one drawback to the rear seat, and that is it feels a little bit narrow. If you have two people back here, it's really no problem, but the middle seat is kind of pinched. The seat just seems maybe a little bit narrower than it could be to provide good passenger room for three passengers. Now, there are some drawbacks to the whole Tesla minimalist interior, and they are felt in the back seat. For one thing, you have rear climate control vents, but no climate controls back here. Rear seat passengers can't change their own temperature. You also have heated rear seats back here, which is a nice luxury feature to have, except 
you can't control them from the back. There are no buttons, there's no screen back here to activate the heated rear seats. Instead, you have to ask the front seat occupants nicely to turn it on using this center screen, an odd decision. But a few good items worth noting back here. For one, there is a center armrest. You fold down this panel in the middle of the seats and you can see it's an armrest, which also includes cup holders, which is nice for rear seat passengers, especially since this will primarily be used to transport kids for a lot of families. Another benefit back here, you have USB ports, and not just regular USB, but USB-C. You can see them below the rear climate vents. Two ports, so one for each rear passenger, which is nice to have. And next up, another notable rear seat item is this latch on the side of the seat next to the headrest. You can use this latch for two different purposes. One is to adjust the backrest to various different positions for more comfort. You can see you can adjust it upright or kind of tilt it back depending on what you're looking for. You can also use this latch to hold it down and put the seat back down in case you want more cargo space. The whole seat back doesn't go down at once. That way you can put a large item in here, but also keep a seat available in case you you want to carry more cargo and still have a rear passenger. Of course, you can also fold the entire seat back down if you want. Just go over to the other side. There's a corresponding latch over there. Put it down and then the entire seat back is folded down. And next up, we move on to the cargo area in the Model Y, where there are a couple of interesting items back here, especially compared to the Model 3, which is, of course, more sedan-like in its cargo area. Now, for one thing you see, it is a large cargo area, totaling 66 cubic feet, Tesla says. That's pretty standard for a vehicle this size. Earlier, I mentioned the BMW X3 and the Jeep Grand Cherokee being about the same size as the Model Y, and they also have about the same cargo volume as the Y. But it is worth noting that this cargo volume is a substantial increase over the Model 3, which is about 15 cubic feet. This has more than four times as much cargo volume as the Model 3, and that alone will push some people to switch from the 3 to the Y. And next up, a few notable items in the cargo area. One is the fact that you can drop the rear seats from back here, from the cargo area. Over on the left, on the driver's side, you have two little switches, and you can pull a switch and it will lower the corresponding rear seat. It's a very easy process, and a lot of crossovers and SUVs have this, although it is worth noting, you cannot use these switches to re-raise the seats. If you want the seats to go back up, you have to walk around and push them back into place manually. Now, one interesting item on the subject of the seats folding down relates to the middle seat, which can actually fold down separately of the other two seats on the side. You can't do it with one of these switches in back. You have to go around and actually pull this little latch in the back of the middle seat. I guess the theory here is that Tesla wants you to be able to have two rear seat passengers in place and also have some additional cargo space in case you want to carry some skis back here or something like that. Makes sense, but the weird part is that when you fold down the middle seat, you have this little bar that's kind of sticking out rather obtrusively and looking a little strange. I guess that's the bar that the middle seat would typically be latched onto when it's in place, but when you have it folded down, it's just kind of hanging out there in space. A little bit of an odd design decision. And next up, I want to talk about the cargo area itself because there are a few rather clever tricks around the cargo space. Now, for one thing, you can see in its natural state, you have kind of a flat floor and then little cavities on either side where you can stick stuff if you don't want them rolling around while you drive. That's pretty standard, but check this out. You pull up on this little leather loop and then you can lift up the back half of the cargo floor where you have an under cargo floor for more storage. A lot of cars have this, but this one is surprising surprisingly deep, you can get a lot of stuff back there. Again, kind of keeping it out of sight and making sure it won't roll around in the larger cargo area while you drive. But that isn't all the clever cargo storage in here. There's also a second underfloor cargo area directly behind the rear seats. You open this up and you can see there's even more storage under here. Again, to place more items out of the way if you don't want them rolling around or if you don't want them to be seen in the back of your vehicle. Now, one other thing I want to mentioned. Like I said, this Model Y has two rows of seats, but a third row is supposedly going to be available sometime in the next year or so. Maybe wondering, how do you get a third row back here? My guess is that the third row is going to be rear facing, so looking backwards, which is a solution that Tesla has used in the past. And I say that because the rear design is just so steeply raked, you couldn't really fit a third row forward facing and get the headrests and seats in place. This vehicle is just too small and it comes 
comes down to low back here. And by the way, one other item worth noting in the cargo area, there is no cargo cover, which is unusual for crossovers or basically anything with a tailgate. So you can't cover the stuff that you have back here. Although I will say that with the factory provided tint, it's really hard to see in. So it's kind of hard to tell what you have in there anyway. You have pretty good privacy, even without having a cover. And next up, we move on to the rest of the Model Y. First, I want to cover a few more differences between the Y and the 3. One is the black trim on the outside. You can see the door handles and various other pieces are black. Most Model 3s have that stuff in chrome. It looks a little better, a little more modern in black, and the Y has its standard in black. And next up, here's another one that's rather silly, the seats. The seats in the Y are the exact same seats as the ones in the 3, but because this is a taller car with a taller passenger compartment, they had to sit them up higher, and so they did literally that. They're just mounted on platforms. <laughs> so the exact same seats as the Model 3 just stuck on these platforms to give them a higher seating position. And next up, here's another welcome change, the panoramic roof. No, it still doesn't open, but you do have one large, uninterrupted piece of glass. No crossbar in the middle. It's just this giant glass piece that lets you feel like you're one with the atmosphere. Although it is worth noting, it is heavily tinted. So if you live in a sunny or hot place, Florida, Arizona, whatever, you're not going to get too much sun coming through there and making you uncomfortable. And next up, another difference between the Model 3 and the Model Y is the wheel design. The Y has completely different wheels from the 3, both the base model and this, the performance. You can see these 21-inch wheels, which I think look really, really nice on this car, although undoubtedly they'll make the ride feel a little harsher. We'll find out in a little bit. And next up, I want to cover the rest of the quirks and features in the Model Y. Now, there's so much technology to cover that I'm not going to get to everything. I did very deep dives into a lot of this technology when I reviewed the Model 3 and the Model 3 Performance, and I will link those videos in the description below. If you want a really close look at all the technology in this car, you should watch those videos. But I am going to hit the highlights here, and that means starting with my very favorite thing about Teslas, and that would be Autopilot. Autopilot is Tesla's self-driving system that will automatically steer, brake, accelerate, lane change for you, and the system just keeps getting better and better. Here I am using it. You can see the car is going around this curve. I'm not touching the wheel at all. It is a very comprehensive self-driving system. With that said, it isn't full self-driving, regardless of what Tesla might tell you. And you have to tap the wheel every so often to make sure the car knows that you're still here and you're still paying attention. That way they can avoid people who are watching a movie or reading while they're behind the wheel and then something unexpected happens and there's an accident. To me though, one of the really cool things about autopilot is the graphic that's shown on the screen as you drive around. It used to be able to show cars and maybe motorcyclists or bicycles and maybe large trucks. That was pretty much it. But it's gotten way more intelligent. Check this out. There's a pickup truck and it's showing a pickup truck specifically on the screen. That's pretty cool. And check this out. Here's a van and it's showing a van specifically on the screen. It's smart, and it's smarter even than that. Look at this, I'm sitting in a stoplight with a red turn arrow and green traffic lights, and you can see the screen actually notices the red turn arrow and the green traffic lights. And it also can see the arrow painted on the ground, noting that I am in a left turn lane. That is a pretty cool trick. And the reason this system now recognizes traffic lights is that Tesla reportedly plans to roll out a version of autopilot that won't just slow down when the car in front of you slows down, but will actually stop when it senses traffic lights. And in my opinion, using this and seeing this screen, it does a really good job of noticing every traffic light and what color all the lights are. It's really impressive and it'll be interesting to see if they can successfully implement that. And next up, I do want to go over two of my very favorite tech features in this car, even though I covered them before in my Model 3 performance review. One is Sentry Mode. All right, check this out. You see these little cameras on the outside of the car? One is here on the pillar. There's another one here. And if you look around, you can see some more cameras. The cool thing here is you can program your Model Y to activate Sentry Mode when it's locked. 
and then the cameras will always be alert to detect motion in case someone walks up to your car. If that happens, the lights flash and a warning actually comes on the center screen, letting you know that sentry mode is activated and you don't want to break into this car. Then when you, the car owner, get back into your car after you've had it parked for a while, it will tell you how many times sentry mode has been activated while you were away so that you can know if someone came up to your car while you had it parked and potentially tried to break in. And because it's cameras monitoring, you can even watch the clips of what sentry mode detected in case something is damaged or stolen. You basically have security cameras for your car. The other feature I really like in here is something called dog mode. You go into the climate control and you can put on dog mode and then you can leave your dog in the car and the climate control will stay on, will keep the interior at a reasonable ambient room temperature so your dog won't potentially die sitting trapped inside a hot car that's pretty cool. But of course you're worried that someone will see your dog in the car, not know it's in dog mode, and then break the window to save it, even though it's nice and cool in here. Well, check this out. The screen actually lets people know that the car is in dog mode and that the temperature is nice and comfortable in here. It's a really cool idea for people who want to leave their dog in the car while they run into a store. And next up, a few other interesting quirks and features. One item worth noting in the climate control, you have something called camp mode. And if you turn this on, it will keep the climate control running until the car gets down to 20% battery. I guess the thinking here is that maybe you can camp in the car and stay at a comfortable temperature and the car will just keep running the climate control, hence why they call it camp mode. And next up, another item worth noting in the climate controls, this is how you turn on the heated rear seats. You see, you just pop into this menu and turn them on. This car even has a heated middle rear seat, which I've never seen before, very unusual feature. Unfortunately, rear passengers can't turn it on themselves. They have to ask the driver to go into this menu. And next up, another one of my very favorite Tesla quirks is the steering wheel dials. All right, you take a look at the steering wheel. You have these little dials on here. And right now, if you move this one, it adjusts the radio volume. Nothing unusual about that. That's pretty standard in most cars, but it's unusually special in this car. That's because these dials do a lot more than just the radio volume. Go into steering wheel adjustment in the infotainment screen and you can see suddenly the dials have changed their purpose and now you can use them to adjust the steering wheel, both tilt it up and down and telescope it forward and back. That is a really, really cool use of these dials. And we're not done yet because if you go into the mirror adjustment in the center screen, the dials are now able to adjust the mirrors. And you can see as I move the dial around, the mirror will move in a corresponding way. So these dials can have various different functions depending on what you're trying to do in the car. And that is just a really, really cool idea. And next up, moving through some of the other noteworthy items in the giant Tesla center screen. One is with the door locks. You can see here that you can configure the locks to automatically lock when you walk away from this car. Modern Tesla models don't have a traditional key like most cars. Instead, most key functions are done from an app on your phone. So you don't exactly walk away and press the lock button on your key fob. And so it's helpful to be able to configure it to lock automatically as you walk away. It is worth noting, however, that if you're letting someone borrow your Tesla, you don't also need to let them borrow your phone in order to gain access. Instead, you just give them this card. This little card will fit in your wallet. You can carry it around. And when you want to unlock the Tesla, just hold it up to this little point on the B pillar and the doors unlock. From there, if you want to start the car, you have to hold the key kind of near the cup holders in the center console and the car will start and allow you to drive it away. So that's what you give to friends or other family members if they want to borrow your Model Y. And next up, a few other interesting items in this screen. One, I love the modes for acceleration. You have either sport or chill going with the modern lingo there. And next up, another notable item in here, you can choose to configure what happens when you stop, like at a traffic light. You can either have the car remain stationary or creep forward 
and you can adjust that setting in here depending on which one you'd prefer. And next up, another item worth mentioning, there are settings for sentry mode, including the fact that you can have sentry mode turn off when you have the car at home or at work. This makes sense because if you have the car parked at home in your garage or driveway and you're constantly walking around it, the sentry mode is gonna activate all the time. You don't necessarily want that, so it's nice to see you can disable it in certain spots. And next up, another cool feature, you have all these cameras in this vehicle like I showed you before, and they are always recording as you're driving along in case there's an incident on the road. And if you wanna save a clip, you can program it to do so when you honk the horn. I guess the thinking is if you honk the horn, you're in some trouble on the road or some dangerous situation, and the car will automatically record and save those clips around your horn honk. Pretty cool. And next up, an unusual item in the center screen is something called Joe Mode. You wanna know what that is? It explains that it will alert the driver when necessary, but keep alerts to the rear passengers at a minimum so it won't distract them or maybe wake them up when you're driving. And it gives the example of rear passengers like Joe's kids. Who exactly is Joe? I don't really understand that one. That one is a little lost on me, but the idea is still pretty good. A system that mainly keeps the alerts and sounds up here so rear passengers aren't disturbed. And next up, some more functions with the screen. For one thing, you can use it to open the tailgate. Just press this little open icon here and the tailgate will pop open automatically. You can also use it to open the front trunk. Press open and the front trunk unlatches, but then you have to go around there and open it up. And yes, this vehicle has a front trunk. One of the benefits of not having a large engine up there. So you have even more cargo capacity than what you have in the rear. Another item I like over in the vicinity of those controls is you can see that the vehicle on screen is color matched to this actual vehicle, blue and blue. That is really cool. The car it shows on the screen is actually your car, which is a neat little touch. I also like how responsive that screen is to your actual brake light and turn signal usage. Check this out. I'm on the brakes and you can see the brake lights light up on the screen, not just in back. And I put on the turn signal, same deal. The turn signal now lights up on the screen to let me know that it's lit up both on my virtual car and my actual car. And one more interesting item, you use this screen to open the glove box. You can see there's a little glove box icon. You push that and that's how the glove box opens up. A little bit more complicated than your standard glove box opening. Now, speaking of interior storage in this car, there's quite a bit in addition to the glove box. For one thing, you have this center console between the seats. You can open that up and there's like a little top shelf or you can pull that out and have a larger, deeper center console storage area. You also have two center storage areas further forward next to the cup holders. The one on top actually contains the wireless charging system. So you can put your phone in there and it will wirelessly charge as you drive. The other one is just a traditional storage area where you can stick more stuff if you don't want it rolling around while you drive. Now, the most interesting thing about these little storage areas is that their lids are magnetic. So you don't kind of latch it down. Instead, you just put it near where it's supposed to go and a magnet does the rest. The funny thing is if you become too animated and try to slam this lid closed, the car will actually display a warning message on the center screen telling you to be more gentle. <laughs> I've never seen this before, a warning message telling you to calm down with your center console lid slamming. Kind of funny. And next up, I want to talk about the interior in general, very similar to the Model 3. But if you haven't been around a Model 3, expect minimalism. You don't have all sorts of consoles and buttons and designs. It's a very simple, very basic looking minimalist interior in here. Some people will really like it. Some people really don't. Personally, I like the minimalist interior. It looks modern and fresh and futuristic, and I think it very much goes along with Tesla's kind of design ethos in here, although I do still wish for a heads-up display right in front of the steering wheel to give you your most important things, what gear you're in, what speed you're going, whether your turn signals and wipers are on, just a tiny little display or a projection onto the windshield like so many other cars. Instead, you have to look at the top left corner of the screen, and it's out of your line of sight and just a little too far away to be completely convenient, they can solve this problem so easily. And next up, a couple of other items worth noting in here. For one, the doors unlatch electronically, so there's no traditional mechanical latch you pull. Instead, you push this button and that will electronically 
unpop the door and then you can push it open from there. But just in case the battery dies while you're inside the car and then you can't pop open the doors anymore, there is a manual door release. You can see it here. You just pull on it and the door will open with its traditional mechanical latch. Although when you do that, a warning pops up on the screen and lets you know that opening the door manually may damage your door trim. So it's not something you want to do very often. And finally, our last interesting interior item in here is the sun visors which are magnetic. Now I've always known that the visor mirror cover is magnetic and it operates in this kind of trick function that lets you open the visor mirror while not having the cover kind of hang down too low. It's a clever little thing. But in this car, the visor itself is not clipped on with a clip, but rather with a magnet. You can pull it off and you can see there's no clip keeping it in place, just a magnet when you get it near where it needs to go, which is a pretty nifty little idea. And finally, I wanna talk trim levels and numbers for the Model Y. Now, right now, you can only get the long range model and the performance. Like I mentioned, long range starts around 53,000 and the performance starts around 61,000. Now, from there, you can get the performance in two ways. There's the regular performance, or you can get the performance with the performance upgrade. So you can have a performance non-performance and a performance performance. Tesla trim levels still remain confusing, even though it appears they've now ditched that P85D crap that most people didn't really understand except for Tesla enthusiasts. Now, like I've mentioned, the base model of the Model Y is coming in about a year, and it will start from around $40,000 with rear-wheel drive and a range of about 230 miles. Now, right now, the long-range Model Y and the Performance both come standard with all-wheel drive, and they have a range of about 315 miles, which is pretty good. Unless you get the Performance performance, then your range drops to 280 miles because you got larger wheels. But you also get performance brakes and a slightly higher top speed. Now, interestingly, the performance performance upgrade is actually free, I guess, because you're getting some stuff, but you're also losing range. So you can choose whether you want the performance with the higher range or the performance performance with the lower range and the larger wheels. Now the zero to 60 time for the long range Model Y is 4.8 seconds. The performance is three and a half seconds. That's a little slower than the Model 3 performance as you'd expect because this is essentially just a larger Model 3. Finally, as for colors, white is free. There are a few other colors available. They all cost a thousand dollars extra. At least that part of this process is pretty simple. And so those those are the quirks and features of the Tesla Model Y. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. Okay, driving the Model Y. I'm gonna start where everybody starts. <laughs> oh, 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 wow, God, <laughs> This is so fast. It's unbelievable that it's this fast. I drive a lot of fast SUVs, but there's a couple of really unusual things about this one. For one thing, it's just so instantaneous. Um, and then there's no sound to it. But you floor it and, whoa! Oh my God. <laughs> I'm sure I'm depleting the range at an unbelievable level right now by doing this, but it's also really fun. <laughs> Holy crap. Wow, that is wild. Obviously this is a little bit slower than the Model 3 performance, but in my mind, it's a trade-off worth making because you get additional cargo space, vastly additional, four times more, and um, you're sitting up a little higher, which some people, oh, everybody wants to sit up, but people do want that, and, and so you have that ability. So you have a more practical vehicle here. Now in terms of steering and handling, um, you can tell very quickly some interesting things. One is um, the steering is still really quick. That was a thing that I loved about Model 3. There was no on-center laziness. The moment you start turning, it starts turning. Um, some automakers don't make their steering quick enough, in my opinion, from on-center. Even good established automakers, most of them in fact, but Tesla has gotten that right. But one big difference you can tell here right off the bat is that this car is taller. And so in terms of handling, um, you're looking at more body roll and you're not gonna have as much of a kind of a sports car BMW M3 uh, feel like you do in the Model 3 performance. But at the end of the day, 
even Elon can't fight physics. That That's a reality of a, of a taller car. This thing is just so cool. You're sitting in, I just, I think it's the best combination of Tesla so far, which is why I'm so into it. I like the Model 3, but like most people, um, I have kind of gotten more and more into SUVs. I have a bunch of them myself. Um, this is where the market is headed. And so this car isn't as splashy as when the Model 3 came out or when the S came out or when the Roadster is going to come out um, in the sense that it doesn't blaze a totally uncharted territory. But by entering this new segment, it's a, it's a different world, especially when the third row comes out and people are able to use this as a realistically practical you know, minivan replacement, Toyota Highlander competitor. That is gonna be a big splash. It is reasonably quiet. Um, nothing particularly unusual here. I mean, it's similar to other crossovers that are at this price point in terms of road noise and quietness. Maybe even a little bit quieter. You do feel more of the road. Um, undoubtedly, you feel more of the road than in a lot of the competitors, but I think that's because this has the 21 inch wheels um, and the larger wheels are just always gonna have that effect. You have less tire sidewall. This the, being the performance model, suspension is upgraded for a sportier driving feel. At the end of the day, it's just gonna be a little bit harsher. Of course, very quiet otherwise, obviously with no gasoline engine, you don't hear any engine noise. Um, one thing I am surprised about is a lack of wind noise. Um, you know, Tesla, it's always a bit of a question because build quality is never as quite as consistent as with um, other large scale automakers. And so you get in one, you're like, well, is you gonna, you know, is something gonna be off a little and you may be able to hear the wind? No, um, actually it feels really, really quiet in terms of wind noise, better than in some recent, the, in the recent, the Ford Explorer I was recently in. All right, highway on ramp here. It's time for some fun. <laughs> Man, it's really quick. And you know, one interesting thing is it just doesn't stop coming. This car has a lot of horsepower. One of the early criticisms of the early EVs, like the Leaf and the Bolt, were like, yeah, it's fast initially, but then it slows down. Well, you get the performance versions of these Teslas and that's not the experience you have anymore. You just have power and power and speed and speed and it just keeps going. And so that's the Tesla Model Y. This is a really important vehicle for Tesla. The Model 3 has been very popular and tremendously well received, but with the market trend toward SUVs and crossovers, this is the Tesla that everybody is going to want. And it's a great vehicle, and it might just be the best, most well-rounded Tesla yet, especially when the third row of seats comes later to add more practicality. Anyway, with all that in mind, now it's time to give the Model Y a Doug score. And the Doug score is 68 out of 100, which is a huge score, truly an excellent showing. That places the Model Y here, among other Tesla models and other luxury SUVs around the same size. The Model Y beats them all, and it's obvious why. It's more practical than the Model 3, it's faster than a BMW X3M competition, and it's got better tech than basically anything. The lowest score comes in styling, where the Model Y gets a 5 out of 10. It certainly isn't beautiful. Beautiful, though I personally don't consider it ugly. Otherwise, this is a great all-around vehicle, and I think it's more well-rounded than a Model 3, and a better buy than the Model X. The Model X costs more money, it's no faster, and it has those stupid doors that are so showy and ostentatious and attention-seeking. I see no real reason now to get a Model X, except for the third row, and even then the Model Y will add that soon, which will probably make the Y the best all-around Tesla in existence. Hey!